Our technology is for degrading PFAS. They're referred to as forever chemicals because they will not naturally degrade in the environment due to the strength of their carbon-fluorine bonds. We don't want to go through all of the effort of separating out this PFAS, but then not effectively handling it after the fact. So our technology is able to efficiently and effectively degrade PFAS. The unit that I think about this in is kilowatt hour per kilogram of PFAS degraded. And when we look at this compared to um, different technologies that have been reported in the literature, we're able to accomplish this in orders of magnitude less. And uh, because of the scale of this problem, any cost in energy savings is really important. Now that chemistry has created this problem, it would be nice for chemistry to fix this problem. PFAS, as you know, is what we call forever chemicals. Uh, it's very uh, commonly used in uh, technology and many other uh, you know, uh, everyday life products. But we have, have accumulated a lot of these chemicals over the years, and they're very persistent, meaning that once they show up in the environment, they never disappear. PFAS stands for per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances, which is a huge class of compounds. But the two most infamous forms are something called PFOS and PFOA. They were used in a lot of consumer products, such as nonstick cookware, water and stain resistant products, and food packaging. Uh, lately, they have been phased out of manufacturing, but that doesn't mean that the problem is gone. They enter our food sources, and they also bioaccumulate. And PFAS is linked with a variety of health concerns, including adverse developmental outcomes, certain cancers, and um, weakened immune systems. And so without intervention, this serves a environmental and public health challenge. Most of the PFAS treating uh, technology so far are simply just moving them around because they're so hard to degrade. Uh, they might enrich it, but then they just basically you know, concentrate it and put it somewhere else then you have a company solve the problem. They will just stop here and they will just send this solution somewhere else. They, they kick the can you know, down the road, the, you know, the pass the bucks. And water PFAS is present in concentrations of around four parts per billion or less. And so this makes it hard for destruction technologies to be very effective. There are mature and implementable technologies that exist for absorbing PFAS. Uh, but after this pre-concentration step, there still needs to be effective destruction methods. And this is really the heart of what uh, we're trying to do here. We take an approach called electrochemical degradation. So electrochemical refer to the idea that you use electricity to carry out chemical rations. People have tried to work on using electrochemistry to degrade PFAS. Some work on so-called cathode side. The cathode will be the positive electrode. Some work on the anode side. But none of them is completely effective. They can degrade some type of PFAS. They cannot work on the others. Oh, they can degrade you know, the PFAS molecule halfway, and then the reaction due to a variety of chemical reasons will stop. So the way we do it, we actually combine this purpose, we call it like a one-two punch. This um, consists of an activation step and a degradation step, and we go between these two modes because it's known that PFAS requires continuous activation in order to effectively degrade it. And so that degradation step involves producing hydrogen peroxide, during the electrochemistry step, and then we activate that hydrogen peroxide to a more potent radical, and then that's able to degrade the activated PFAS. So we have a cathode, and then we actually uh, pair up with something we call a redox reservoir, which is basically a uh, piece of battery material that we use as a counter electrode to pair with that reaction. We have um, two electrodes that both make things that are effective for the treatment of PFAS, and it's all happening in one cell. So we don't have to add any outside chemicals. We produce just the concentration we need. We're not producing too much, and we can instantly use it for the process we're trying to do. And so that can greatly improve the energy efficiency of this process. And with the scale of this problem, any cost in energy savings can make a huge impact on um, the scalability of the technology. What we have done so far is a demonstration of proof of principle. We show that uh, from a scientific principle point of view, it works. We have done the careful analysis to show 
the degradation happened. We've been dealing with pretty ideal solutions because this is a lab scale uh, demonstration and so dealing with more complicated systems is one thing we really need to do. Another is potentially looking into some of the mechanistic details so we can figure out what the limitations of our system is. And then the last is probably working on the scalability. So there could be a lot of potential to develop new products, new technology, new solutions, uh, you know, and this is actually uh, why I hope this is a, you know, a timely uh, invention and timely solution to this uh, big problem. Hi, I'm Jennifer Gottwald, Director of Licensing at WARF. To learn more about this technology, please use the contact information on the screen. And please remember to like and subscribe to see more of our great videos.